Good morning, Bristol, I suppose. I've been wanting to say that for a long time. Uh, despite my accent, I actually spent most of my childhood in South Devon. I still have a house down there as well, so Bristol's kind of you know, a bit of a home for me. And my middle name actually is Brunel as well, so I've got some kind of connection with this place. I'm not kidding, it really is. Um, what I wanted to share with you today was, as, as Barry rightly put, was an opinion. But an opinion based on the fact that I'm the Vice President CTO for VMware and that I've spent six years building what we're talking about today. Um, I joined VMware six years ago. We were 7,000 people worldwide. We were famous for a hypervisor. Um, we're now over 20,000 people worldwide with a turnover in excess of $7 billion. Um, we're a very large company now, which is challenging, and we've been through some changes. But what we've been doing that whole time from the office of the CTO, which is the department I'm in, uh, is driving a strategy that we're continually revealing. And there is an ultimate plan. We're not making stuff up. And so some people who've seen me give my presentation now for five or six years go, Joe, you're using some slides for five years ago. I am, because it's the same strategy. We're just exposing a new bit each time. So my job actually is, is kind of 50-50. One is chief technology officer, and the other is chief talking officer, which is what I'm doing right now. And most of it is going around talking to our customers and talking to our partners. And not just our largest customers. I spend a large portion of my time at our VMware user groups, the biggest of which tomorrow is in Birmingham, the UK VMUG. Um, and I'm going to be giving the same presentation there tomorrow, so you can skip the first hour if you want to go. Um, but the reason I go there is because that's where I get to talk to the people that are actually using our code. And they're the people that you know, I started my career as 20 years ago managing and, and maintaining computer systems, and that's where I still have my heart. So I have these conversations with CIOs of massive multinational com you know, corporations, and in the next minute, maybe a conversation with a guy who runs two hosts in a school in um, southeast England and manages 20 VMs, and his challenges are just as valid and vital to my strategy as, as the you know, CEO of some large company. But everyone seems to like this new cool buzzword, right? Digital transformation. Or let's talk about digital business. Or let's talk about digital strategy. To be honest, if you're talking about those, you're about three or four years too late, really, in our business right now. And a lot of people seem to think there's a difference between digital business and, and traditional business. Like there's a whole new way of doing business compared to the old way of doing business. And, and they're going to exist side by side. You're going to have the traditional business, and we're going to have the digital business. And the challenge is this bimodal thing, if Gartner will actually, you know, if you listen to them for more than five minutes without laughing. Gartner with bimodal are wrong. They're very, very wrong. There is no one or the other. What we're living in in the world is, is one world. And that one world is very much all business is digital business. But what does that actually mean? Because it's all a bunch of marketing as far as I'm concerned. And so in the conversations I'm having with customers, when I go out and see people and talk to them and see what they're doing with technology, what are they actually doing? And so the question that I want to ask you and the question that I ask my customers is not what's your strategy for digital, but more importantly, what's your strategy in an all-digital world? How are you going to cope and change in a world where everything is digital, there is no traditional anymore? And it manifests itself in four major projects and four business priorities which become IT imperatives. Every organization I go to, large to small, has one, if not all four of these things running. And that is, first of all, they're talking about they want to create exceptional experiences, which usually ends up being some kind of mobility play. At the same time, they say, oh, we want to differentiate with data and applications. We need to modernize our applications. They're all a bit out of date. Or we want to be more agile. We want to respond instantly to opportunities. We want to future-proof our cloud. We don't want to get locked in. And at the same time, we care about security. And most projects I speak to customers about fall into one or more of these categories. And you're probably identifying with a few of these topics as I go through them myself. But what's my top tip for you for being digital? How do you end up being digital? Well, the simple thing is, and this is my big message to the industry and to you right here, is please start with the user. This is where we've gone wrong as an industry. Those of you who've been around here quite a while will know for the last 20 years or more, we've turned to all these conferences where we talk about aligning IT with the business. Every one of you has heard about aligning IT with a business at some point. What we forgot was we forgot to align IT with the users. We ended up aligning IT with the business. Now, let me explain what I mean by that and why there's this rub between, you know, bring your own device and all these problems. 
And it's really simple to explain. Those of you who work in a reasonable size organization will have to submit expenses. Yep. Now, what I want you to do is think about when you go back at the end of this week or the end of this month, when you go and fill in your expenses system form, whatever it is. How many of you, when you're filling that in, truly feel and believe that that process that you're doing right there was designed to make your life easier? None of you, right? That's why the giggles start every time. Because do you know what? The expenses system wasn't designed for users. It was designed for the accounts department. The HR system wasn't designed for users. It was designed for the accounts department. The timesheet system wasn't designed for users. It was designed for management. The CRM system wasn't designed for salespeople. It was designed for sales management reporting. The student administration system wasn't designed for students. It was designed for student administrators. And think about that. And think about that is why IT is so broken in most organizations, because they faced the wrong direction. There's three ways we faced in IT. The first one was we faced the data center, because we thought that's what IT was all about, flashing lights and bits and pieces in rooms. And, and that was right when it was the sort of, you know, the area that only a few you know, white men in white coats in their mid-30s understood and could run in the 1960s and 70s, and that was it. And then we started to turn around and face the business. And we built all these processes and fantastic books about how you can align IT with the business. And that's where a lot of us stopped. But the winners are the ones that have kept turning and are now facing users. And I believe our biggest challenge as an industry, and particularly our challenge for VMware, and a challenge for a company like Computer World, which is one of our key partners, is actually who we're going to have to help deal with, who we're going to have to address going forward in the next five to 10 years, is our customer's customer. And that's really important. And I want to explain to you what I mean by customer's customer. Customer's customer is your users. You're our customer. But you're going to see VMware help you sell to your customers. You're going to see Computer World start changing from selling to you to selling, helping you sell to your customers, because that's what you're going to have to do. And I want it that one day, instead of moaning about the system that you give them, you'll see someone, one of your users, one of your customers, whatever they are, walking along with one of their colleagues or one of their friends, showing them the really cool app that you've given them and how it's changed their life. And think about when that last happened to you, if at all. I mean, the real rub here is the fact that things are moving faster than ever before. And if we keep focusing on the business and not the user, we're never going to keep up. So there's a cycle that I drew many years ago when we were trying to build an early strategy for what to do next in IT at VMware. And I'm still presenting it today because it's still valid. It's a modified OODA loop for those of you who are into that kind of thing. And it's the cycle of IT. And that cycle of IT is the fact that, first of all, you analyze a problem. You analyze a problem that you decide needs fixing with some kind of app, which is what IT is all about. It's about apps. It's about fixing problems with technology and fixing and developing an application. That application is then used by users and generates data. And then you analyze that data and you update the application. And that's the cycle of IT. That's what you do. Whether it's rolling out a new version of Windows, whether it's deploying a new CRM, whether it's updating the student information system, whatever it is, you're going around that loop. Now, the secret is, and the reason why everyone's saying, oh, digital transformation, digital this, digital that, is because some companies recognize this loop existed. And they also, at the same time, realized that if they went around this loop faster than anyone else, they win. Those are the companies we all aspire to. Google, Facebook, Amazon. They're the guys that go around this cycle faster than you would ever believe. You hear Amazon talk about the fact that you know, they bring out you know, so many updates a second to their website. That's because they have to, to stay ahead. So actually, the focus for you is really, as an IT organization, how do you get around this loop quicker? Because you enable yourselves and your people to get around this loop quicker, then your user experience will change. And the way that you develop applications will change. The way you deliver applications and data will change if you get around this loop quicker. So contrary to popular belief, we do not have an office of the CTO at VMware that sits there looking at things we haven't virtualized yet and how to virtualize them. It's not what we do. We've had a mission since, well, I suppose several years now, five, six, seven years, on how do we get our customers around this loop quicker. 
It's that simple. And what's fun is the other people in the industry who have been going around this loop have been spitting out technology as they do it. They've developed stuff, not for selling to people, but they've developed stuff because they had to to get around this loop quicker. So all the stuff you know and all the cool buzzwords you've heard of, like scale and big data and microservices and containers and design for failure, all of that stuff wasn't Google deciding what cool product they're going to sell to you next or Netflix deciding they wanted to sell an architecture. It was they had to do these things to get around this loop faster. And we're all benefiting from that. So how do we take all of that cool stuff and how do we make that consumable by the masses? How do we make that that everyone gets access to this technology? Because ultimately, I want you to have a conversation, or I don't want you to have the conversation that I had with our HR department. Not that conversation, that was a completely different conversation I had with the HR department. Um, the conversation I had around our app. So we have an HR app at VMware. It's a SaaS app, it's deployed through our fantastic um, Horizon workspace. We get it all remotely, blah, 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 whatever. Someone screwed up. So I get my holiday. I get 28 days of holiday a year because I've been at the company so long. Um, they're trying to get rid of me. Um, and so you think you go into the HR system and it says, here's your 28 days. When would you like to take them? No. First of all, I have to pick what pool I'm pulling my days from. What? Whether it's some previously accrued year, blah de blah or something else and rolled over into Q1 from... I don't care. That's an HR term. I don't need to see that. And then get this. I don't have to put in I want five days off. Oh, no. I have to put in I want 37.5 hours off. I'm paid by the month, right? I get holidays in days. I don't certainly stopped booking hotels by the hour a very long time ago when I left the army. Um, so, you know, I do not need to book my holiday by the half hour. And I sort of sat there and I was struggling with this system and eventually I gave up and I've not filled it in for three years. Um, and that's why they came and had a go at me about it. And I said, my assistant should have been doing that. And she said, I don't understand it either. And th this conversation I had with HR, they, they said, oh, well, um, did you not do the computer-based training? There's a 45-minute online internet computer-based training course. And I went, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry, I must have missed that one whilst I was really busy doing the 45-minute computer-based training for buying something on Amazon or for selling something on eBay or for using Facebook. UIs are like jokes. If you have to explain them, they're bad, okay? And this is the fundamental problem we have. Another great example from an energy computing perspective. We had uh, one of our customers globally, in EMEA actually, uh, they, have, uh, they, they manage and, and inspect and control railways, kind of like rail track in the UK. And they had these ruggedized devices they gave to their engineers. And these rugged devices cost 2,000 euros each. They had a VGA level camera in them and a serial port. Right, and you can buy these today with serial ports on. It's awesome. I think they want to use them to manage Cisco switches. I'm not sure. But anyway, so you, you buy these devices, and they were giving them out to people. And the battery lasts about four to five hours because it's nickel metal hydride because it's obviously, well, that's obviously the latest battery technology. Um, and so what these guys have to do is they have to go and take pictures of faults and stuff on the, on the track, and then they go back to their office where they then have to plug the serial cable into some other wanky dongle thing, and then they have to try and get that to work, and then it uploads, and then finally, guess what? They were getting complaints because no one was taking pictures, because the devices were getting broken despite being ruggedized, and that's because people hated them and threw them across the floor of their van. Um, at the same time, they were complaining about security because what were people doing? They were getting their iPhones out, taking pictures of the track, and emailing them. Oh, my God. How terrible is that? So we had a long conversation with them about end-user computing and mobilization and starting with the user. And we said, well, why don't you give them iPhones? Oh, I can't give them iPhones. iPhones are for management. And they're very expensive. No, they're not. I could buy three iPhones for the price, four iPhones for the price of this thing that you're giving them. Oh, but they're not ruggedized. Yeah, I can buy you a $15 case that ruggedizes the iPhone. So they gave them iPhones. But they locked the iPhones down to the point where all you could do was take pictures of the track with them. And guess what happened to the iPhones? And so then we went back and said, well, why don't you let them use the iPhones for their own stuff? And guess what? No one breaks iPhones anymore. They look after the iPhones. The iPhones are charged. Things work. They've got a lower cost. They thought about how to finally, with a bit of coaching, how to give people what they wanted, rather than their preconceived ideas about how things should be. 
I go and talk to supermarkets about the fact that they're looking to replace the handheld scanners with apps. But the apps are really cool because it's the same app they're developing for whether you're scanning shopping or whether you're an employee scanning shopping to put in a basket to deliver. I went to Next to go and buy a sofa earlier this year, which is not a fun experience with my wife anyway, but after the two and a half hours of holding different bits of cloth against different types of sofa, we finally went to the back and said, this is what we want. And then this guy who was about 17 years old and has obviously borrowed his, borrowed his suit from his dad, um, led me over the back where he sat me down in front of the next website and then just led me through how to use the next website to order a sofa. And I went, well, actually, do you know what? I'll go and do that at home. And that's what they want. They don't have to develop an in-store ordering system. It's the same interface. So there's new ways and new ways of thinking of doing this, ways of getting around this loop quicker. But what does this mean for infrastructure? Because my job has been to get infrastructure out of the way. So to tell you what's going on in infrastructure and what's going on with cloud and all the stuff we announced at VMworld, I need to take you on a small history lesson. Now, I take you back to 1987. We had a problem. We couldn't build one hard drive big enough or fast enough to meet the needs of the then new and exciting relational databases on mini computers from companies like DEC that were going to take over the world. And so what we invented was a thing called RAID, which was a way of making a bunch of small disks look like one big disk. What we didn't realize back then was this was cloud. We just didn't call it cloud because marketing people weren't allowed anywhere near the data center with their crayons. So we called it RAID because in IT, we're really good at coming up with acronyms. So RAID, for those who don't know, stands for a random array of inexpensive disks. The inexpensive bits are lie, depending on who you buy it from. Um, but I mean, my favorite acronyms are GNU, which stands for GNU's not Unix, which is iterative, which as a computer scientist is awesome. And the other one is Twain. Remember the Twain drivers for scanners? Twain stands for technology without an interesting name. How cool is that? <laughs> Seriously, look it up. It's true. So RAID is a boring and uninteresting name, but essentially we had to come up with a better name for what we were trying to do. Because what we're doing here is we're saying, OK, fine, this is like cloud, right? You don't get to see the disks. You just get to, as an app, come along and consume disks. You get a LUN. And then if a disk fails, we don't all go crying and get upset. It's kind of expected. Oh, designed for failure in the late 80s. Wow. Nothing new, OK? So to understand what we're doing in the industry, I just need you to take a little bit of a leap of your brain. I'm going to help you here. I'll do my own slides, as you'll tell from the quality of the graphics. Um, we need to swap the disks for pictures of data centers and swap where it says RAID for an operating system for data centers, which the marketing people did get near with their crowns and called software-defined data center. But when we drew it, it was an operating system for data centers. And an operating system for data centers is a very important concept to understand. Because to do an operating system for data centers is very hard. You have to do what we did at VMware, which is literally amass the experts in developing operating systems, developing systems at scale, developing parallel computing, networking, storage, etc., to build this. And I'm surrounded, luckily, by you know, the guy that invented containers on, Sol on Solaris, the guy that architected eBay, the guy that built Google's distributed file system, the guy that wrote the kernel for Windows NT, and so the list goes on. I've got the guy that invented MPLS works for us, which is kind of an interesting guy to sit out. He's Bruce Davey, Australian madman, but he's awesome to talk to, despite being into networking. And um, so we have this amazing array of people that work alongside me building this architecture and understanding this plan. Because what ultimately I wanted to do was the vision was that you'd have these data centers, you'd have an operating system for data centers. On top of that, you would put an application in a VM and then if a data center failed, it's about as exciting as a disk failing in a RAID array. <coughs> now, I can guarantee today that your reaction to a data center failure is markedly different to the failure of a disk. But I want it to be the same. And that's the plan. Now, to do that, I have to have the ability for VMs, applications, to move freely from one data center to another without human user intervention. I want the operating system to do that. Much like in a disk, you don't get to say which disk it goes on. You just chuck it at the radar and it does it. You don't care. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, I have to have virtualized compute. I have to have the ability for a VM to move from one location to another. And with vSphere 6 and now 6.5, which is the most exciting thing happening this week, it's not the launch of a new Metallica album on Friday. It's um, the fact that 6.5 came out yesterday. Um, it's not also, it's Top Gear this week as well, isn't it? But no, it's definitely 6.5 being launched this week is important. But we announced the, the ability of long distance vMotion. I can now move a running virtual machine from one side of the transit, one side of the Atlantic to the other. Now, long distance vMotion is a pretty cool thing. 
what makes me laugh is when I first did, we first talked about vMotion, everyone looked at it and went, nice gimmick, no one's ever going to use it. Now it's a standard feature of how you manage VMs. We do have one customer that still has a paper-based approval system for vMotion, which I still don't quite understand, but they're a bank, so you know, you've got to be with them. Um, they're about 20 years in the past, like every other bank. Now, the next thing is once you've moved that virtual machine from one data center to another, you have a problem. There's a big bunch of people that tend to get really upset and stand in the way, they're called the networking team. They're the guys that will scream about IP addresses and security and firewall configurations and routers and all this other kind of stuff. They will not understand what you're doing. And so what we had to do was we had to work out a way to abstract away the networking team. How do we put networking into software? How do we virtualize networking? How do we make it such that an IP address stays with a virtual machine? How do I make it that the security stays with the virtual machine? How do I make it that, in fact, where the virtual machine physically is has no concept or bearing on the network? And that's virtualized networking. Some say we did it to upset Cisco. That was a happy side effect, but it wasn't the reason we did it. <laughs> we did it because we needed it for our operating system. We needed it as computer scientists to make this vision work. So once you've moved your SQL server from New York to London, once you've now got the networking just kind of going there, and it's happened, you have another small problem. Your SQL database is still in New York. So what you need is a distributed file system. And that's what we're working on now. So vSAN, which we're now allowed to call vSAN, um, is exactly that, a distributed file system. Something that aggregates, just tell them I'm presenting. Um, there's aggregated file system, I'll call them back. This aggregated file system is something that we're working on now. We've already got it to stretch metro clusters, but we will get further once we beat the speed of light problem. We'll, we'll solve that one. Uh, we will actually get that to work, and we're getting on it now. So we get to this point where virtual machines will be moving freely around within this construct of an operating system for data centers. But of course, the world doesn't stand still. The world isn't all about just VMs now. The world is about other workloads. Apparently, there's this really cool stuff called Docker. So actually, this plays into what we were doing exactly. Because we weren't building something for VMs. We were building an operating system, a platform for apps. So when something like Docker comes along, which essentially is just containerized workloads in an operating system, we go, okay, fine, well, what we really need to do is provide a northbound API off this operating system that someone can come and talk to it and just do Docker. And that is Visa Integrated Containers, or VIC, as you'll hear it talked about. What happens is if you've got people playing with Docker or containers, you can spin up Visa Integrated Containers, it's free, and that gives them a northbound Docker API. From an ops perspective, you see lots of little VMs spin up, but they don't get to see that, because why do they need to see that? It's not what a Docker developer actually wants to. The last thing they want to do is manage the Docker machine. They just want to spin up and, and use containers. So it's, OK, how do we now support and build both new style applications, which are currently containerized applications, build something like a PaaS on top of it, which, to be honest with Cloud Foundry is trivial, but also support the old world. And the old world is important too. I have a customer running on vCloud Air, our public cloud, DOS 6.22 virtual machines. I'm serious. It's their door tag entry management system. You know, it's secure by obscurity because it still runs on DOS 6.22. Um, but that's what they use, and they run it in there. So I've got to support DOS 6.2 all the way through to Docker on this platform and make it transparent underneath. That's our challenge, and that's the software-defined data center. So that's the story we kind of told up to this year. What happens next? Well, what happens next is what we announced this year at VMworld, and was always the plan. That this operating system isn't just an operating system for data centers. The operating system is an operating system for clouds. And the idea always was that we slip in there as that operating system that sits on top of all clouds and under all applications. And we've been taking steps, and increasingly bigger steps, towards that over the last 12 to 18 months. And there's more to come. So what did that happen? What did, so how did that happen? What did we manifest ourselves as in terms of this cross-cloud operating system for clouds? What actually is that? Well, let me drill into it a bit more for you. So if we start out with classic VMware software-defined data center, that's an on-premise software-defined data center. So that is, you're running vSphere, you're running vSAN, you're running NSX networking. You've got it all lovely tied together and up to vCenter. It's all automated, secure, scaling, lovely, wonderful stuff. Well, the idea is that with our partners, 
we get them to run the same platform. Now, we've been doing this for a very long time. Our vCloud Air network partners, there's over 3,500 of them in Europe alone, are running these tools or this software to build their public clouds. And so we join together with other people. So we have the vCloud Air network, which is the network of our partners all running that stack. We have vCloud Air um, itself, which is our public cloud, which runs that stack. IBM announced at the beginning of the year that their public cloud is going to run our stack. And they renamed it recently to Bluemix from um, Softlayer. But the IBM cloud runs VMware. And what we announced at VMworld, or just before VMworld, was the fact that AWS will now be running the VMware vSphere hypervisor on AWS. That means that you can freely drag and drop Yes, vMotion, virtual machines from on-premises to any one of those clouds, and importantly, back again. And when you're there, have access to NSX, have access to vSAN, have access to all of those other services. In fact, if you go to the IBM cloud with your vSphere box, you can access all the IBM services. If you go to the AWS cloud, when we launch that next year uh, in production, you'll be able to access all the other Amazon services as well. So what we're giving you is choice. That operating system for clouds, that thing that runs across everything, is expanding as we go. It was always the plan. So next, there's still non-VMware compatible clouds. I wanted to go with like a VMware inside logo, but apparently that wasn't acceptable, or like a powered by cross-cloud or something like that. We might still do that. But ultimately, VMware Cloud Foundation is the name for the stack of software that we put on top of this. VMware Cloud Foundation is literally vSphere, vSAN, NSX, a thing called STDC Manager, which ties it all together and automates the deployment of it, but it stops at vCenter. So these things, these clouds, are all compatible, cross-compatible at a vCenter level. So to get into a little bit of technical detail, essentially, you'll see these clouds appear in your web console. There'll just be other data centers you can drag stuff in and out of with vCenter. You don't need to deploy a lot of cloud management stuff on top like vRealize. You can if you want, but this hooks in at a vCenter level. So now you have the power. Someone says, I need more capacity, and you're running a small bunch of services on premises. You can hook your vCenter up to a public cloud and start managing it as if it's a natural, logical extension of your cloud your on-premises data center. More importantly, NSX allows you to extend your private networking into it as well. NSX also allows you to turn security and encryption on, on those connections. It makes the whole thing a seamless extension. That was the plan, and still is. Now, for those that aren't running VMware, which still includes Amazon AWS AMIs, um, we have another plan. Sorry, I've got another slide about Cloud Foundation. I'll snip over that one. We have... Um, another plan, because you have Amazon, you have Microsoft Azure, you have Google Cloud Platform, and IBM Traditional Cloud with their own way of doing things, which is um, still there. So what's the story there? Well, the story there is, on top of Cloud Foundation, which is running and powering all the vSphere compatible clouds on the left, we will be introducing next year something we're calling cross-cloud services. Cross-cloud services will be software as a service from VMware that allows you to manage and deploy across all of these clouds. So we're going to bring you in the ability to look at an application in one lens across Amazon, Azure, Google, and all these others. Things like management and automation, networking and security, and data and governance extending across all these clouds. Now, I'm not going to do it here because it takes a little bit longer, but if you want to go and have a look, the, um, the keynote from day one well, they call it a general session of day one of VMworld in, in Europe, which is in Barcelona. Uh, towards the end of that, about an hour in, Guido Griermeyer, a friend of mine who's the CTO of networking, stands up and demos what we do here. But one of the cool things we do here as an example is you give it AWS credentials. It goes and auto-discovers everything that's in Amazon. It shows you it as an application hierarchy and architecture. It then allows you to take control of it. It allows you to then maybe even convert and move bits of that to other clouds. We actually showed it rolling out onto Azure. So taking something and moving it across. And showed you how we can show in one lens an application with its performance, governance, and costing across on-premises, VMware-compatible clouds, and other public clouds. 
It's incredibly powerful. And it's something we'll be launching next year. But there's demos available now, and there's early betas being played with. So this software as a service is going to change how you engage with clouds. It's going to change how you manage clouds. It's really quite a powerful piece of kit. From the end user computing side, how do we help you start with the user? What are we doing there? Well, really, our focus here has not been on virtual desktops. Big surprise, you say. Well, that's because I, I actually, um, just a, a small bit, when you get to interview to be the CTO of a software company, it's not done in two interviews. I had 23 interviews to get into VMware that went on over periods of days and nights and God knows what else in various different places around the world. And um, of those 23, I upset two people, apparently. And I upset two people by telling them that the virtualized desktops are a stopgap. And strangely, they were the guys that did virtualized desktops and didn't believe they were a stopgap. They are a stopgap. They're a stopgap in a proper plan for end user computing. They have an area where they play. So there's areas that make sense in terms of if you want remote 3D, you want remote VR and all those kind of things. You need access to lots of, com lots of um, compute power remotely, lots of crunching remotely. They make a lot of sense. If you want them from security perspective, they make a lot of sense. But in terms of delivering applications and data to users, they're a stopgap. What I mean by that is someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got an iPad. I want to run our new wonderful CRM system on it. And you go, ah, the problem is that the new wonderful CRM system is a Windows app. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to deliver a virtual desktop to you on the iPad. And then you're going to have to run the Windows app in the virtual desktop on the iPad, which, to be brutally honest with you, is a disgusting experience, however much you make it look nice. It's still not fun. Um, if you think you're done at that point, then you've failed. What you should be doing is saying, OK, phew, let's give me some breathing time whilst I work out how to rewrite the application to deliver it natively to iOS and an HTML5. That's what I mean by a stopgap. So what we're on about from our end user computing is how do we help you on that journey? How do we help you do what we call consumer simple and enterprise secure? I talked about earlier very much at great length about the difference between enterprise apps and consumer apps. The easiest way to explain it is when someone next asks you if something is enterprise grade, the answer I want you to give is, how worse than consumer grade are we talking? Because in terms of experience, that's exactly the truth. You think about the experience that you get on applications in your handheld life, and then think about that and compare that to when you then try on your mobile device to engage with your organization. How different is that to the way that you organize and engage with others? We want to make that as simple as possible. We want to provide a platform to make it easy to write applications, to be able to deliver applications, to be able to secure applications and data. And so the focus here is on delivering applications and data securely. That's it. The two users and two multiple devices is kind of implied. That's, you know, why do I have to say that? We know that. But it's delivering applications and data securely, because that's what you need to focus on. It's not focusing on securing devices. Because you focus on securing devices, it's a very old way of thinking about IT. It's a very old way of thinking about security. The new way of thinking about security isn't that you own everything and control everything and your perimeter extends to everywhere. The new way of thinking about IT is that your perimeter has shrunk back to your data center and everything outside that is dirty. Everything outside that is compromised. So how do you deliver data and applications securely to a potentially compromised device or location? That's the problem we're trying to solve for you. And that's the problem we have solved with Horizon and Workspace ONE. What we're solving is the way that we can say, OK, fine, I can deliver to any iPhone. I can securely deliver. But here comes the fun. This is where you have to do customer's customer. This is where you have to sell. And the example is perfect from within VMware. Two examples for you. Example number one, we rolled out AirWatch, which is our device management content delivery system, map delivery system for um, within VMware. Now, this is how we rolled out VMware Watch. We rolled it out classic enterprise style, which was the CEO of the company, as you know, it was president, it was Carl back then, sent an email out saying everyone must install AirWatch on all their devices. <coughs> Great, cool, it's interesting. You want me to install on my private device something called AirWatch. Not gonna happen, mate, sorry. Don't see what's in it for me. Someone might see what's in it for you. I probably guess what's in it for you, but I don't see what's in it for me. 
So then we have emails going around through the management chain. Only 13% of your people have installed AirWatch. We need to have more people install AirWatch. Everyone must install AirWatch. It's, it's got to be installed. And it came to a point about six months later, I was actually at a dinner um, with some customers, with our CIO. We can't often get our CIO and let him out loose to um, the public. And I was at dinner with a bunch of CIOs with our CIO, actually, in Barcelona. And um, we sat down talking about this. And I sat with Basque, who's trying to push out this thing. And I said, um, he said, so why don't you show them AirWatch on your device? And I went, I'd love to, but I don't have it installed. He was like, oh, what? Why not? I said, because I can't see what's in it for me. And then he cracked it, because he knew. And he said, do you ever get those emails where there's a link to the intranet on them? Someone sent you an email from like, someone who sits in an office all day and doesn't realize there's people that work outside the office and send you a link to like, the, the intranet page that no one's been on the intranet for 20 years, but it's still there. Uh, and they're going to send you a link to it. And you click on that, and of course, it doesn't work on your phone. He says, well, if you install AirWatch, it puts a certificate on your device that means that we don't have to uh, manually configure a VPN and you can securely access all the content that's back in the data center without having to do anything. You just click on those links and they work. I'd installed it by the end of dinner. No kidding. It was that easy because you just downloaded the app and did it. And then when I got the iPhone 7 recently, when I upgraded because I'm that kind of guy, um, I got my phone, pulled it out of the package, configured the iCloud pieces of it for myself, then I went to the store, I downloaded the AirWatch agent app, I put in my corporate username and password, and bang, everything was provisioned back to my device. My email was configured, the device was secured, I could click on all those private links again, everything worked, it was done. It took about three minutes. That, to me, was the power of AirWatch. Example number two, Skype for Business. We had Skype for Business rolling out now at VMware. We had our head of IT for EMEA, who I didn't even know existed in the many years I've worked here, uh, turned up to our EMEA management meeting, our EMEA staff meetings, and said, we're rolling out Skype for Business. Immediate reaction from all the vice presidents, you're not taking my WebEx from me. You'll pry it from my cold, dead hands. I love WebEx. They're salespeople. They've got no clue. Right? Or I want to keep using PGI conferencing because I absolutely love that whole music. Um, or whatever. And his answer was exactly the answer you have to give nowadays. I'm not going to force it on you. But I'm going to make it so cool and compelling to use that you'll want to use it, that everyone else will start making you use it, you'll love it. And do you know what's happened? That's exactly what has happened. The way they've rolled it out, the way they've delivered it, is they've made it seamless into our lives, they've made it work. They've made it something I want to use, not something I have to use. And this is how Google, Facebook, and others start with users. This is exactly how they work. They give you something you want, and in return, without realizing it, you give them what they want. Think about it. If we rolled out Facebook internally as a corporate enterprise app in most enterprises today, it would go along the lines of someone would send an email out on a Monday morning to everyone in the world saying, hi, we're launching a new thing called Facebook. We want you all to respond by Friday with a list of all your friends. And uh, fill in this attached spreadsheet with all the places you've been this week, and if you could attach some interesting photos, that would be nice. And then on Friday, 20% of people have responded, so now we have to hire a task force of people who are now the Facebook chase-up team who will go out and chase people up for their Facebook reporting system and we'll, now and we'll have like charts of how many people are and aren't responding to Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, and this is how it will work. Within our Does that sound familiar? Now do you see what I mean by start with the user? Now do you see what I mean by let's think about what they want and then they'll give you everything you want off the back of it? If I gave a CRM system of sales to a sales guy that was so useful that he wanted to use it, that he had to use it, that he felt that it changed his life, then all the reporting I want will just come out the back of it. Why, when I fill in a holiday form, do I have to fill in a holiday form? I have a calendar that's integrated with Office 365. Why isn't it that I just go in and put holiday in my calendar and the system works that out and the process kicks off off the back of it and an email gets sent to my boss who then approves it and sends it back and it's done? Why do I have to go and engage with some other system to do that? Why do I once a year have to go and work out how to log in to the whatever it is that we have this strange appraisal system thing that HR love, but we all use once a year, and every year you have to remember how to use it again. Why do I have to do that? I shouldn't have to do that. It should be easier than that. So our vision really plans out like this. We're truly sitting there saying we're going to help you build and deliver any application, be it traditional apps, cloud-native apps, or SaaS apps, to any device. And I truly mean any device. Our end user computing solutions today are used to manage and secure Coke machines, of all things. Those new ones that have the touch screen on that allow you to choose any flavor. That's all managed by AirWatch. We have cars managed by AirWatch. We have all manner of different things managed by AirWatch. At the same time, the way you develop and deploy and support applications will change. And with cross-cloud architecture on top of the cross-cloud services down to cloud foundation, we hope we're going to give you everything you need to have the choice you want. 
the choice to deliver and deploy anything you want on any cloud, manage anything you want on any cloud, and then deliver anything from any cloud out to any user. So what's next? What's actually the office of the CTO working on? Because we kind of delivered most of this. So what am I actually working on day to day? What goes on in Joe's head? Oh, you don't want to know what goes on in my head, but what goes on in terms of research? What are we looking at? Well, a few things. AI. Talk about VR here. VR is a, a sort of a, an adjunct to what we're talking about here, but AI is actually probably more key to what we're looking at going forward. When I talk about AI, I'm talking about it in multiple different contexts. I'm not talking just about the fact that, you know, for example, that the... the um, the compute and intelligence that's gone into, for example, the new Tesla, which has the equivalent of 150 MacBook Pros worth of processing in one Drive PX2 device just for their autonomous driving, shipped in every car. But beyond that, what does AI mean to us as an industry? And from our perspective, there's something really, really cool that can happen with AI. Now, I talk to all the time about an operating system for data centers, an operating system for clouds. What if I could put AI on that? What if I could put AI in that? What if I could ultimately create what I'm calling intelligent, invisible infrastructure? What if I could have it that the infrastructure itself configures itself based on things that it sees? There's an earthquake on the east coast of America. I'm reconfiguring dynamically now based on news reports before it hits me and moving my workloads to other data centers. It's raining in this part of wherever. I'm moving resources and web servers closer to that environment so that when they start buying umbrellas and all this other kind of stuff, we're already there and pre-shipping it and done. Have you noticed recently on Amazon that some things when you order them are next day delivery and some things they'll deliver to you that evening? Seen that one? We'll deliver it between 6 and 10. Do you know why? AI tells them that you're the kind of person that orders those kind of things at that time on that day and is pre-shipping stuff closer to you. That stuff isn't in an Amazon warehouse. It's in a distribution center around the corner from your house waiting for you to order it. How freaky is that? <laughs> right? But what if I could do that with data centers? What if I could have workloads spin up automatically? What if I could say, oh, do you know what's really funny? Manchester United are playing this afternoon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to get Betfair servers. I'm going to pick up their front-end web servers. I'm going to move them across the network. I'm going to put them to run in the cell tower on the distributed NFV cloud that we've put it there so that they can be running um, the fastest website for the best response just for people in Old Trafford who are talking direct to that cell tower on their phones. I picked the plug those names out of the air, by the way. That's not something that's happening for real. But these are the scenarios we're talking about with customers. That's what we're looking at with AI. It's really exciting and cool stuff. Internet of Things. Everyone has to talk about Internet of Things. Everyone has to have an Internet of Things slide. This is my Internet of Things slide. But think about some things. And here's some interesting stuff for you. One of the things is the backhaul network's really important. You'll notice recently it was the massive DNS, the, uh, the DIN attack that took out a whole bunch of websites because someone did a, a denial of service using IoT cameras and other stuff to um, basically trash DNS on the Internet. We could have stopped that if we'd had those things managed and secured with a network that was deployed using NSX, an overlay network that controlled that. We could have controlled that also in terms of how you collect and aggregate this data. We also look at how we, we build those networks to support that. I had a great question recently. With um, I was at an event with a TV producing company, uh, one of the big networks. And I said, why are you putting out set-top boxes? They put out a new set-top box. Um, I said, good Lord, you know, I've got Samsung TVs throughout my house. Everything in my house is all built in Samsung applications. Most of it's streaming from a phone to the telly anyway. I don't have any things plugged into my TVs. Everything's all streaming. So why are you expecting to put a box in my house? The answer, it's not a set-top box. It's an edge server. And the fight now is who and how gets to own your house. Is it the Amazon Echo? Is it Samsung? Is it Apple TV being the hub? Is it Sky TV putting out Sky Q, I think it's called? Is it whoever putting out their box into your house? Is that what's going to control that? How do you secure that? How do you manage that? How do you deliver services to that? That's something we're looking at too. Serverless. Oh, God. Complete lie, terrible name for something. Serverless is never going to happen because you always need servers. Actually, what serverless means is it's a billing engine for PaaS. But what we're looking at is how that impacts our customers and how that works. And unikernels, which is the proper out there, go Google it, what the hell is that kind of term. 
Uh, unikernels is very, very, very small VMs. It's kind of what comes after containers. It's VMs for light bulbs. It's VMs for light switches. It's VMs for cars. But they're not really VMs. They're unikernels. It's a whole different world. It's what comes after Docker, if you're interested. So it's worth looking at that, too, if you want to really dig into what we're doing. But ultimately, I've got a couple of questions for you to think about as we go forward. First of all, your future will be hybrid. So understand how you build yourself in the hybrid world. Everything you deploy will use two or more of these boxes, on-premises, off-premises, IaaS, PaaS, SaaS. So someone says, we use Office 365. We're fully in the cloud. Really? How do you print? How do you? Oh, that's sort of on-premises IaaS, isn't it? We've deployed salesforce.com. We're fully SaaS. Really? Surely the first thing you did when you deployed salesforce.com was you did um, a link back to your on-premises Oracle financials. That's a hybrid app as far as I'm concerned. Everything you do going forward is going to be hybrid. Hybrid between different providers, hybrid between different strata, hybrid between different locations. How do you do that? How do you build that? That's our problem that we're trying to solve. We're trying to help you with. Hopefully you've understood with what I'm talking about here. Next, how are you going to get your organization around this loop quicker? And I'll tell you right now, we've put some fantastic things in the industry in place, such as ITIL and Six Sigma, to make it as slow and painful as possible. Right? So trust me, it's not easy. But there are ways to do it. But most important, please, if you take anything away from this, is please, please start with the user. Go back and think and do things differently. Don't align IT with a business. Talk to users. Find out how you're going to change their lives, how you're going to change the way they interact with their world, and how they're going to interact with you. Because ultimately, that's how you'll be successful at digital transformation. Thank you very much. Cheers.